Change is hard. Changing the way you think, renegotiating your relationships, losing weight, that's all coming up on this, our very first episode. We're also going to take a look at those things we can't change. The death of a loved one, depression. Today we'll meet an Aussie mum who found refuge in her faith and in comedy. So keep it locked right here at the table and let's talk. Yes, welcome to The Table, a new weekly show about family, health, faith, and basically whatever we find interesting. Now, let's just get straight into something that's guaranteed to outrage at least some of you, C-sections. Apparently, there are some women who just dial up a C-section from the very beginning of their pregnancy. No complications or anything. They're just too posh to push. Was that any of you ladies? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I hate it how there's so much, oh, there's such a stigma with C-sections because 32% in Australia, 32% of mothers choose to have C-sections. That's over a third of us. So why is it such a big deal? Why is it so taboo? Oh, I think it's because the World Health Organization recommends that it's around 15%, so it's double what they're recommending. And, you know, there are some people that decide to do it just for the, they just decide that they want to have one, not for medical reasons. Yes, but we shouldn't boohoo the ones who have got to have it for medical reasons. Yeah. I yeah. had to have it for mes medical reasons. Mm -hmm. And it's not the easiest thing to go through. I did both natural and C. I'd much rather do a natural. It's much easier to get up and get going again. The C-section is not easy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you decide that you needed it once you um, were already in the delivery room? Or when did you decide? Because I had problems with my first child, the doctor spoke to me about having a c-section with my second child yeah look i haven't obviously had any children i'm only 20 years old so yeah. <laughs> but it's definitely something you've got to think about right? definitely and i was like reading about the pros and cons of this and i tell you what the benefits of c-sections are pretty incredible okay it can be scheduled right mm -hmm. um it's quicker than most labors and as we know time is money um it's Basically pain free. I mean, cons like compared to labour, compared to labour. All right. Did you say pain free? I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. A lot, a lot less pain than labour. Put it that way. I don't way. know if there's anything pain free about giving birth, whether it's C-section <laughs> or, or natural. Yeah. Even postnatal can be yeah. painful. It's worse, I think, with C-section mm. than it is with a vaginal oh, birth. Really? Apparently. Yeah. And I think oh, there's so okay, many well. benefits to having a baby naturally. You know, like the mm. um, extra fluids are pushed out of its lungs on the, throughout the birth canal and whatnot. So I'm definitely one for if you can. Did obviously, you have natural birth? I did with my twins. Yeah. I was, um, I just 50-50. Look, I'm not going to judge people who have the C-section or go vaginally. Do Just do whatever's best for, for yourself and your baby. Mm. As long as you both come on the outside, you know, on the <laughs> other side. That's the important thing. I think that's yeah. the, the important thing. You know, we can't, we can't be judging people. But I do know that this, I've got friends that uh, won't, won't push because they don't want that vaginal area changed in any way. I, mean, I, can I don't know if you're taking though. selfies or what's the go. <laughs> oh, yeah. But you know, actually, um, in some countries, it's worse than it is here in Australia. They have percentages up to 40 and 50% in like Dominican Republic and in Brazil. Wow. So we're not, Australia's not doing that badly. But is it too easy for obstetricians just to say, too, baby's too big, let's, let's cut you open? I think it is. And I think the medical profession, like it just goes to show how technologically advanced we are that, you know, a C-section can be done like that. The scar is only about this big, you know. Uh, really? This big? Mm. Well, Which mine it was. Okay, well, you know, it's, just, it's not Well, it's now, not now it is smaller. Now it is. Because back in the day, they used to give you a big cross yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever it was. But yeah. I think mm. it, apparently it's a small slit now. Small slit. Not that I would know, but. <laughs> yeah, look, um, I, I've read this information about women who don't want to push. And, and, you know, why are you going to have a baby if you don't want to push? True. I don't know. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, look, clearly we all have an opinion on the science of birthing, but let's take it to the next level. There's a whole lot of discussion on parenting and baby forums on the internet about the idea that apparently babies in Africa don't cry. Have you ladies checked this out? Shona? <laughs> <laughs> I loved this article. <laughs> Did you really love it? Or? Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> Um, the, the whole article was about the, the African nunna, is, it, is that how it's said? I don't, I don't know how it was said, but the grandmother right. who just every time the baby cried, stick it on the boob. And I'm like, 
Whoa! That was her words of wisdom to, yeah. Yeah, to her. Yeah. Was to just feed it if it cried. Don't worry about changing the nappy or looking at anything else or putting it to bed. Just feed it. And oh, I'm really? Like, well, what she actually said was she said, you all are reading so many books, you need to learn how to read your baby. Read baby. And yeah. so it could be that your baby does need to be changed and you're reading that sign. But yeah, one of the things she did say was feed it, feed it, feed it. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I had a friend, a conversation with a friend today who's Kenyan, and I was asking if he thought this was true, because that's my first issue with this entire concept, is how do we know that the African babies don't cry? Do we go and survey all the African mm, babies? Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> they must be robots. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, they were covered up. They were wrapped in, and all of that. And I remember when I had my two children quite a few years ago, that was one thing we were really careful about in, when we went out in church or public places was not to hand the babies around too much because they get tired, they get they sore, get unsettled. they get unsettled, people in their face all the time. And I thought that was a good piece to the article, but I was a bit concerned about feeding all the time. I mean, ooh. <laughs> what about you, Rachel? You've just got a newborn. How do you you feel like in terms of breastfeeding or, or form, formula feeding? Um, I definitely breastfeed, but as I think through this article and think of why it might be, I was thinking of some of the community that they have. They have community around mm. them. It's really important. The fact that she even went to her grandmother to ask for advice, many of us would even discount going to a grandmother and maybe asking for advice every time we have an issue. So I think some of those reasons are the reasons why the African babies they're saying don't cry as much. And my friend did say he believes it's true, that when yeah. he goes to Africa, he hears that many of the babies when he's visiting home don't cry as mm. much. Wow. Yeah. I know I know personally, I, I breastfed both of my babies and I always just throw them on. So I can, I can understand that, um, that it works. I it think it's work. the baby wearing as well. They, the way you swaddle? Or? No, they wear the babies like um, with the mm. cloth. Coddled up. Oh, Coddled really up really the babies are constantly to close to the body, even all the way through, um, all the way as a toddler. Yeah. They're still being very close to the mother. And also the families, um, if an older sibling can um, take care of the child, I think there's always someone close by, a family member who can bring comfort to the and child. Just get, yes, that's right. Have that touch and whatever else the baby might need. Mm. And I know when I was bringing up my children, that was something I didn't have because my family aren't here. And so it was just me and my husband looking after the kids. And, and I think having community, because it takes a community to grow a child, mm. we even need church, that. Even awesome. church provides community yep. yep. as well. OK, ladies, family. moving on. Time for a home hack now with my girl, Michelle. So summer holidays are over and everyone's heading back to school. As a busy mum of nine, I like to find fast and effective ways to make this transition smooth for the kids. So my daughter gets a real kick out of this at lunchtime when she opens up her lunchbox. She sees cool fruit, not boring fruit. This actually catches on down at the primary school. All the parents are doing this now. So if you want to jazz up your kids' lunchbox a little bit, try googly eyes. Googly eyes makes everything fun. Do your kids complain about their apples being brown by the time they eat it at lunchtime? Well, don't worry, I have a solution for this. What I like to do is cut up the apple as you normally would. Chop it up into pieces and then you pop all those pieces back together, securing it with a hair tie. This means that by lunchtime, all your daughter or son has to do is take the hair tie off and the apple will be as if you had just cut it now. No more brown pieces. Joining us at the table to talk weight loss and all that good stuff is our very own super qualified nutritionist from Sanitarium Health and Wellbeing and also our new bestie, Trish Guy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's been great to be here today. I think um, my question is breastfeeding. As a mum, I know when I was breastfeeding, I was so hungry. I could eat like a horse, maybe a <laughs> calf and, you know, the offspring. It's true. How do you How do you portion size, you know, and how do you carve that kind of hunger? Well, I think the <laughs> important thing to remember, remember when you're breastfeeding, you are making the most important food for the most important person in your life at the time, your little baby. So it's not a time to worry about your weight. Um, your body will naturally help I like you, you already. lose that weight. <laughs> <laughs> how did we know that? Yeah. <laughs> I like you because you have food on the table. Oh, yes, it smells <laughs> quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, um, obviously a lot of people, pretty much everyone that goes on a diet, you know, struggles to lose weight. Why is it so hard to lose weight? And are there any, like, fad diets at the moment? Yeah. Do you know about? There's probably different reasons for different people um, when they may struggle to lose weight. But some of the common reasons could be that um, snacking can be a real problem. And we're becoming a real nation of snackers. And, you know, this kilojoules in snack can add up really quickly over the day. I've got an example here of a, a slice of banana bread, which is actually probably a lot smaller than the piece you'd see in, a, in your cafe. But mm. the actual number of kilojoules in that 
one slice of banana bread, you'd actually have to eat three whole bananas. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see that. So you can hold up the banana foods. bread there yeah. and see. That's pretty small. That that's is a tiny small. piece of banana bread. Right. It doesn't yeah. even have any butter on it. No, no that's not even going to touch my sides. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if snacking can be quite helpful, but the important thing to remember when you're snacking is to choose really good snacks, like fresh fruit, veggies, even a whole grain cracker with a bit of peanut butter or hummus, you know, really getting in some whole foods, using it as a chance to get some extra veggies in over the day and just being really mindful of the snacks. Now, you know, Trisha, sometimes people really want to lose weight, but they have no idea where to start and they yep. feel overwhelmed. Yep. What should they do when they get in that situation? Yeah. Well, I guess being a dietitian, I really would recommend people, if they can, see a, an accredited practicing dietitian because they can work with you to help you come up with goals and strategies that work for you, your lifestyle and your family. So that is a really great place to start um, if, if you can do that. But um, I think a good thing to remember is that, um, you know, none of us put on a lot of weight in a very short period of time. Time. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Mostly. So it, it can be quite hard to um, expect you to be able to lose that weight really quickly. So I think making some small changes, starting off small, and making some changes that you can stick with um, for the you know for the rest of your life is is really important. So rather than finding a a crash diet, something that will fix the problem really quickly, mm -hmm. looking to make changes that you can stick with for the long term and changes that fit in with your family as well. Now I have, a friend and I were having a discussion the other day about the cost of all this, the food, you mm -hmm. know, the quinoa mm -hmm. and the kale and everything <laughs> else. How do we get around the costs and things like that? Well there are certainly lots of trendy foods out there as you say, like the kale and the quinoa and you know, if you can afford them and if you do enjoy them, that's great but the good news is that lots of the fruits and veggies, grain and other grain foods that you know we've been eating for a long time, they are just as good for us. So you know any other cruciferous vegetable, uh, you know broccoli or cauliflower or other leafy greens like good old silver beet, you know they're just as nutritious as kale and some of these other trendier foods. You know foods like wholemeal bread and whole grain crackers, oats and muesli for breakfast and wheat bix, you know you don't need to buy the expensive quinoa. And I suppose we could always grow it in our own gardens couldn't we? Absolutely mm. and that's a great way to get some extra exercises as well you know yeah, that's, that's another certainly. important tip for yeah. helping to, you to lose the weight is to try and find ways to keep active thanks so much for that Trish I think I'm going to be avoiding banana bed from now on <laughs> now if you're keen to maximize your health getting physically active is absolutely essential today at the table we have limited copies of this great book live more active by dr. Darren Morton to give away all you need to do is visit us on Facebook and tell us in 25 words or less your favorite way to get fit 25 oh. words or less. <laughs> you can't, can't do that. that. I can't do that. Well, I'm looking forward to trying it out. That's fantastic. Time for a new start. Check this out. Okay, so New Year's resolutions. Some of us make them, we mostly break them. Do you make them? And if so, why? If not, why not? Never. It's pointless. <laughs> if you're going to change something about your life, you do it when you want to, not at some special time of year. Never make them. No. Never. Well, I never really make them, and if I do, I don't keep them. <laughs> so they're kind of pointless? Yeah. Agree? I sometimes try to, like I say I'm going to do something, but uh, they haven't worked so far. Do you make New Year's resolutions? Yes. 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 Stop smoking. Stop smoking. Eat the good food. Do you set goals for yourself throughout the year instead? Or... Uh, <laughs> I take life as it comes, darling. <laughs> <laughs> you can make a goal anytime you want. But not, not only for the New Year's Day or Christmas Eve or whatever moon festival. <laughs> yeah, anytime if, if you want to make yourself better, you can make a goal. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's what I think. Okay, so confession time. Whose New Year's resolution for 2017 are nothing but a dim memory <laughs> now? So we put them down on the paper and they're out the door. Well, you know, this year I decided not to make any resolutions per se, but I decided to make it my year of yes. So start saying yes to opportunities and things that I would be scared to do before. Oh, Love so will that. you come and clean my house? No, no, no. no. <laughs> I was thinking the same, Shana. Yeah. You can't volunteer me for things. These are for my goals, not for just saying yes oh. to any old thing. Okay. Like, yeah. But yeah, when I have something that I'm scared of, but it's a great opportunity, like, I'm like, yes, I need to go for that and do it. So mm. it's yeah. Does anyone recycle their New Year's resolutions? Oh, I don't mind. Year. Every Dude. year I'm trying to lose weight. I mean, I just put that yeah. aside. <laughs> I, I don't do New Year's resolutions. I'm just like, pff, not doing it. 
I what haven't done it for years. Mm. I, for me, it doesn't give me room to listen to God. Mm. If oh. I, if I, you know, if I work out my New Year's resolutions, that means God doesn't have a chance to work through me. Mm. So I leave it to Him all the time and just, yeah, pray about what that? I need. And Do you think it's okay to pray about our New Year's resolutions? So of we course, pray about everything. And, yeah, yeah. 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 Praying about yeah. Yeah. what yeah. your commitment is wherever Definitely. it be. Where do you well, want, Where do you want to lead us this year? What do you yes. want us to do? I actually make a lot of my New Year's resolutions based on that. So one of them is pray without ceasing so that you're constantly led by God to, you know, make decisions. So, so you're praying all the time, all day, every well, day. Well, okay, it's, it's a figure of speed. <laughs> <laughs> How does it um, work out, though? Um, yeah, look, it definitely, I mean, every year I make New Year's resolutions. I get, like, you know, the new diary and stuff and, like, new stationery and everything. I'm always motivated. And, it, yeah, it usually works out, especially when they're spiritually focused. I find that they're much more sustainable than, you know, oh, exercise every day. <laughs> I think, I think the same so. could be said for relationship with God as well. Like, this year I wanted to be a better me. Um, mm. Being a better me meant spending more time with God. Exactly. But what I did find at the beginning of this year was life happens. Yeah. Mm. Things in your life happen. The devil throws all sorts of things your way. Yeah. So how do you stay committed? It was, okay, okay. <laughs> there was actually a video I watched, and it was this little four-year-old girl, and she was talking about New Year's resolutions, and it was really cute. And she said, people think it's the one time to change and they feel guilty when, you know, they don't mm. they, they don't keep their new resolutions. But she said, change happens in a thousand little moments. And each that. little moment that you choose what's right um, instead of what's easy is when change happens. So I, was, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, um, like going off of this point of something spiritual, like I had a goal and then I was just trying to pray about it and see if God, if that was something that he wanted me to do. And I was just trying to listen. So I think we can have goals, but then be ready to change them. If, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. you feel yeah. like there's something that you need to change. Don't get stuck in that. that that's my goal. Oh, I can't move off it. <laughs> yeah. I've got to stay there because that's my New Year's resolution. That's why I don't like them. Because be heart ready, be mind yeah. ready to, to take in be what, open. what, what yeah. God is or leading. And you I think you can do it any time of year. Some people think they have to do it only at January first, but yeah. any time of year is a good time for change. Let's check out what's in Gia's kitchen. Where do you get your vitamin C from? Well, did you know that sweet potatoes actually contain over 70% of the recommended daily intake of vitamin C? Well, neither did I. And now I know, and I love it because I love eating sweet potatoes and sweet potato chips. Olive, what are we making today? Sweet potato chips. Yay, high five. Are you gonna help me? Yes, okay. So all you need is cut up wedges of sweet potato, leave the skin on, and it doesn't matter what they look like. That's the good thing. I have a bowl here with one tablespoon of olive oil and I'm just gonna throw the wedges in there. And any seasoning. Now I love to use onion powder and garlic powder because it gives so much flavor without using too much salt. So just throw that in there. Sesame seeds, they taste delicious on sweet potatoes. Some salt, some good salt. Just half a teaspoon. And I'm using mixed herbs. Any mixed herbs will do. Do you want to try that? I'm not going to try it, it's raw. And so you just flip it, make sure it's all mixed through, all the oil and all the sesame seeds and all the good stuff, stuff sticking, sticking to the side because it was underneath. And then we're just going to put it on our tray. Oh, we're going to use that for the ones we've cooked. Delicious. Okay, so just put it through. Make sure they're spread out really well and you put them in the oven, they cook really quickly. They're not gonna be as crunchy as the ones you get from the shops, but they're gonna be delicious and better and much better for you because you know what's in them. Oh, they look awesome. Yes, you can. So our chips are ready. And we cook them for 20 minutes at 200 degrees Celsius. I'll blow on it. Do you wanna dip it in the sauce? No, you can have it like that, okay. I'm going to dip it in the aioli sauce that I've made because it is delicious and I can. If you want to get the recipe for the aioli sauce, please visit our website and our YouTube channel. Mmm, mmm, that's good. In the 1940s, the US Army and Air Force asked the American Medical Association for advice about the most effective sunscreen for soldiers. Ancient Egyptians used jasmine and rice bran to protect their skin from the sun. Ancient Greeks used olive oil. Modern scientists recently discovered that these absorb ultraviolet rays and help repair damaged DNA. 
people used to think that it was the sun's heat rather than ultraviolet rays that caused harm to their skin. The concept of SPF sun protection factor wasn't introduced until the 1960s. Look, sometimes when you're a mum, life is tough and the struggle is real daily. You've got a choice at that point whether to laugh or cry. Hannah Boland, our next guest, has had her fair share of tough times and she's chosen to laugh. Actually, she's chosen to be a stand-up comedian and make others laugh. It's great to have you with us, Hannah. Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be here. Awesome. Now, before we get into it, let's take a quick look at some of Hannah's material. You love a bit of false advertising, don't you? I know I do. Like when I bought these pants and they labelled them as skinny leg jeans. <laughs> bother asking my husband questions anymore like do these pants make my butt look big because I know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> it's not the pants. <laughs> so I guess she's gone. Can I go <laughs> oh I can so relate to that. <laughs> you definitely have to get some tickets. Um, <laughs> Hannah how did you become a comedian like what is it that motivated you to say you know what I'm going to become a comedian. Yeah it's it's kind of an interesting journey that you probably wouldn't expect. I, I've gone through a few tragedies in recent years where I actually lost two um, of my babies within 18 months of each other. Um, so following those losses, I went through a, you know, quite a, a journey of depression and um, PTSD and anxiety, and there's still things I struggle with to this day. Um, but as I started to come out of that very black place, um, I realised you know, what a gift in those dark times laughter is um, because laughter doesn't actually solve any of your problems and it doesn't change your circumstances, but what it does is remind you of what it's like to laugh again. Mm -hmm. um, and that, for me, that was a really hope-filled experience, um, just remembering that what it was like to laugh. And I, I just felt a real um, deep calling from God actually to bring that hope to others through laughter. I love that you say that, that you had a calling from God. How has your faith um, influenced mm. your, um, you know, your acts as a comedian? Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty funny telling people that being a comedian is a calling. <laughs> um, <laughs> get a lot of funny looks. <laughs> I think it's great though, you know? Yeah, well, and, and this is the whole thing. I think God's really raising up some people out of the caves um, and in some really unique ministries um, just because of the culture that we live in, you know? Mm. We're having to reach people in, in all sorts of different places. So, um, yeah, it was a bit of a shock at, at start. You know, I, I, I think I, I've always been a performer. Um, I've, I've been a professional musician. I've always been used to doing speaking and being on stage. So that was nothing new for me. Um, but to have a, a really clear sort of focus um, at this time to... Oh, I'm completely stuffing this up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've got a hair in my mouth. <laughs> You know, where did you find laughter in those dark yeah. moments? Because you were saying that you really felt laughter in the dark moments. Where were some of those places you were mm. able to find laughter? Um, yeah, so watching a really funny movie, um, seeing a comedian, um, just having a really good laugh with friends mm. as well. So, um, yeah, that, that was sort of the big ones for me. Yeah. yeah. So tell me, I mean, comedians and Christians, you don't tend to see them. Yeah. Through, <laughs> I don't know, like, they're yeah. kind of mutually exclusive here. So how do you... How do you do that? Because then, like, there's usually like crude jokes. Yeah. And, you know, you're then everyone sort of finds funny. Off people, that sort of thing. Yeah. How do you make your jokes? It's it's an ongoing challenge because it's very hard to be edgy without crossing any sort of line. Exactly. That's it. They're sort of yeah. So it's it's an ongoing challenge because everybody draws the line in a different place. <laughs> um, so and they're sort of two very separate, but the same parts of what I do. I, I work in the secular world. I do the comedy festivals and, and do secular shows that are clean. But then I also go into the churches as well and do outreach events and work with ministry teams and, and that sort of thing. Because comedy is a great way of bridging the gap uh, to the sort of unchurched world and, and humour breaks down the barriers to be able to share the gospel. So um, I, I sort of have two different audiences in that way. And I have to be honest and say that you really have to be extra, extra careful what you say in churches more than anywhere mm, else. Imagine. It's really tricky. Yeah. And, and speaking of outreach, um, there's something new in your life? 
Yes, so I've officially, as the outreach ministry part of what I do, I've begun um, a ministry called LOL Ministries, and that's very... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, hold on, <laughs> LOL. <laughs> That's um, laugh out loud, not... Yes, not lots of love. love. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my aunt still signs every email, LOL, auntie, um, because she thinks it's that. Mm. But, yeah, LOL ministry. So that's the basically going into the churches and, yeah, working alongside ministry teams to utilise the comedy. Awesome. That's great. Oh so I guess a part of staying on top of things is maintaining a positive attitude, as Hannah has, even towards people who annoy you and give you those help me Jesus moments. <laughs> At least that's what Maritza Brunt talks about in her article in the Signs of the Times magazine. She says it's important to give people not a second chance but a first chance. Is there even such thing, Shona? Oh, you ask me? Yeah. <laughs> I ask you. yeah, I'm the queen of you get one chance and that's it. Well, <laughs> tough life. No, so you do yeah. give people first chances? Mm, first well, chances don't cost me because otherwise... Yeah. yeah, look, and reading her article, I had to laugh at some of the things and yeah. as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, oh, I did that with my husband. Oh, when he put the red shirt in with the <laughs> white underwear and everything came yeah. out pink and I was like rah, 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 at him. Yeah. It, like it all comes down to having expectations, expectations though yeah. and like those expectations being broken and I find in my life I actually struggle between like having standards and having expectations because like there's certain things that I deserve like in a relationship yes. or whatever it might be but there's also certain things that like I expect and I, like differentiating between the two can be very tough I think. But do you let other people know your expectations or are you like the girl with the Valentine's Day who sits there and waits for it to happen and doesn't say anything and then is really deflated oh, when it doesn't turn up. That's what yeah. annoys me. You need to be upfront from mm. the get-go and mm. say, hey, this is what I expect. Exactly. But I, I took something totally different from the article. Yeah. Right. yeah, I was thinking more that it's the opposite of having prejudice. You know, like when people approach situations yes. and they approach people, they have a prejudice against them. And I think it's about wiping that slate clean, giving that person a chance to be who they are and maybe even giving them another chance. So when you, by the time you get to that second chance, you've yeah. given them mm. that first yeah, opportunity. Yeah. We always size each other up as mm. soon as we meet each other. <laughs> That's true. You think, yeah. oh, I've met someone like that before. You must be X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So I think it's about the opposite of prejudice. And I think, mm. you know, for me that plays into my Christian faith, but it's something that I struggle with, you know, to be Absolutely. able to give people that first chance. Yes. I think sometimes yes. we just need to relax and take a chill pill sometimes. <laughs> Not everything needs to be your way. Maybe mm. if you um, take things out of your own perspective and, and look at someone else's perspective, like wear their shoes for a little bit. It might, you know, as Maritza did with her colleague, you know, she looked at him and thought, mm. um, you know, he's annoying me, whatever. But just concentrate on what you're doing. Just do your thing. Yeah. I think that's what's important. I agree. Stop trying to control everything. Trying to control you know, I kind of thought of it too with you being a comedian. If mm. everyone thinks as soon as they meet you, like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to laugh, I'm going to laugh, you know? <laughs> and it's probably that same <laughs> sensation with people. If we just give them that first chance that they're going to be a good person. Mm. And I think, like, I guess, I guess the moral of the story is just... Uh, what should I say? Accept Just people for who they are who and what are. they are and, yeah. and take them at face value. Yes. Yeah. 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 And allow people to make mistakes, because I do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's been great to have you at the table with us today. Jump on social media and tell us what you think. Share this video with your friends and check out all the other great videos, articles, recipes and home hacks at your website, thetabletv.com. See you next time. God bless. <laughs>